My name is Verna Wallace. I was born in Campbell River. Um, my dad is from here, Cape March. I'm with the uh, Mikola Nation. Avis um, asked me if I would like to do it, and she told me what she was doing. Um, and she told me that she wanted me to tell my story about Indian Residential School, which I did. Um, I didn't really get into details because the kids were too too young, mm -hmm. and you can't do that because mm -hmm. you don't want to hurt them. I mean, we've been hurt enough; we don't need to have any more hurts going on. So it was kind of hard to be in the Indian residential school because so much bad things have happened to all of us kids. What people don't get is that we were only six, seven, and eight when all the abuse started, any kind of abuse started on us, so. And uh, non-natives don't get it. Mm -hmm. It just breaks my heart. We've been told that we were lying about what happened to us in the schools. Yeah. Um, and when you're told that to your face, you, you don't know what to say. You just stare at them. Right. Even talking about it hasn't really calmed me down. Um, I wish it would, but it's because the older people don't seem to understand, you know. I said to one lady who stopped me on the street there and asked me why um, I was wearing this orange shirt. So I explained to her about the 215 marked graves that were found. I said, those babies are waking you guys up. I said, if you heard the story on the news. Now you guys, the majority of you guys, will believe what happened in the Indian Residential School. I hope before I die that I know majority of the people understand, you know, because we were stolen. I don't know how my dad felt when he came home and seen no kids because my dad wasn't drinking. My dad went out fishing, and he'd come home and he'd take care of us all the while my mom was in the hospital. So I always wondered how my dad felt and all the other parents that it happened to. And when I do this talk, I like to include all the people across Canada because all went through the same thing. We all lost family members. My brother got murdered. My sister went missing 50 years ago, and she was an Indian residential school survivor. Her story will never be heard. Um, and one sister was 60 scoop too, so from Indian residential school to 60 scoop. Can you believe it, that they did that to her? So she had double jeopardy there. I'm Irene Widenitz from Cape Mudge. I'm an elder from Cape Mudge. I'm an elder support worker, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This world is such a crazy world we live in right now. And one thing I don't like is when people call other people down and say, go back to your country and all this. And But what everybody doesn't know is or they should know is that the only true Canadians are the natives. 
you, all the uh, people came from a different country, every one of them. And that's one thing you have to learn to respect other people because you came from a different country too, you know. And that's one thing I think everybody should know that we're the, we're the only true Canadians and Americans, it's the native people. And that they should respect other people just like, you know, they respect themselves. Gela Kasla, Gela Kasla Delkula, Nugwa Omnalaga, Gayuklin La Kwakwakiwa Get Ligwith Dao. He knew Dikyon Kaukuna. My English name is Avis, and my Kwakwala name is Nalaga. Uh, Nalaga in English is uh, translates to bring, uh, bringer of daylight, and my Haida name is Kaukuna, which in English is translated to um, one who sits great. I come from the Kawas Destas Eagle Clan in Haida Gwaii, and the Gigalgum Namima of the Ligwith Dao in uh, Sakwalutan, which is uh, also known as Cape Mudge in Ligwith Dao territory, which is one of the 18 tribes of the Kwakwakiwak. So I wanted to create this workshop honoring our Gingananam to create a space for the Ligwithdao youth to come together to cultivate wellness and healing because our communities are in a time of grieving with the unveiling of the children's remains in residential schools across Canada. And I wanted to create a space for us as a community to come together in this time of loss. We took a, a, a residential school desk and we covered it in cedar bark. And the desk itself held so much negativity. It held the trauma and the darkness of what those children endured in those genocidal torture institutions. And we covered it in cedar bark. We blanketed it in cedar bark. Um, and Tony Frank, the one of the other facilitators in the work, she said it, you know, we set those spirits free within the process. And that's what it really felt like. We felt felt like we were um, setting some of the spirits free of the children who sat in those desks. The reason we covered the residential school desk in cedar bark is because cedar bark is our most powerful medicine here on the Northwest Coast. So cedar is a medicine that absorbs our energy our emotional, spiritual, um, mental energy. So the thoughts that we think, um, the feelings that we're feeling, um, cedar has the ability to absorb all of that. I'm a person who was a really good example of somebody who had been successfully colonized and successfully assimilated. I carried the shame, that toxic shame that had been put on our people through residential schools. I carried that shame on a very deep cellular level, the deepest part of my being. And when I touched cedar bark for the first time, that was the beginning of my journey of that shame starting to be taken from my being. And I believe wholeheartedly in the, the ability of cedar to help our people to heal. And so we wrapped that desk in cedar bark because cedar is more powerful than what the government and what the churches did to our people and to those Gingananam. They tried to eliminate us. They tried to take our culture. They tried to break us. And our culture is stronger. We are stronger. And Lig with Dao, you know, the, the translation is we are unkillable. And that was really shown in this work that they did try to eliminate us, but we're still here. And that was a testament to um, the power of our culture and the power of the medicine. What's like the best part about, you know, being here and seeing the weaving happen? I love seeing the kids. They're really getting involved in it, you know? And it's, I'm just so amazed how they're doing it. You know, they won't talk at first, but as soon as they get into the weaving, yes, it's amazing to see them do that. You know, I am so proud of those kids for doing what they're doing, you know? What do I say to people that are looking at the nets? Um, well, to me, it means a lot because it's the youth that are doing it, and, I'm, and they're quite proud of themselves for doing it, so. 
that makes me proud of them because they are doing it, I guess, kindness for the people that went to residential school. So I'm quite proud of them for that. Yeah. For me, it was really um, an important part of decolonizing. I've um, To be in community with the intergenerational um, component of sharing knowledge and healing to be with elders, you know, women in our life, sacred life giver, givers in their 80s, with uh, young women, our Ginganam in their, um, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old, that intergenerational um, exchange of knowledge and healing um, and transmission of um, love and support was incredibly inspiring to see. Intergenerational trauma gets passed down in the genetics of our of our beings and intergenerational wisdom also gets passed down and I don't think that gets talked talked about enough. It's just such a beautiful gift to see that intergenerational transmission of wisdom that comes from our ancestors. It lives in their genetics, in their DNA, this beautiful gift of this connection to cedar and this connection to the land and this connection to the sacred art form of weaving and to see their connection to that, connecting with the um, ability for our culture to heal, for the drum to heal, our language, our breath, these states of embodiment. Um, I think the more we can expose our young people to those, um, to those facets, the stronger our nation will be. So that really, that was really what it meant for me was to just be a very small part of that and, and to get to see the youth um, slowly um, open up to those ideas. If you could give a message to the younger generation, what did you tell them? To love themselves and just to go to school and have an education and be good and good to everyone and love everybody and be respectful. Stick to your culture, speak your language, get your education, and care for each other. Don't fight amongst each other. You have to take care of yourself. It would be so nice to see that happening. And it is starting to come together. That is what I would like to happen for these kids. Might start off with four or five, but you know what? It's gonna just take off. It is. Yeah, it's gonna ripple effect. Yes, that's right. You belong to Awitna Guis, the land. You belong to Gigigame, the creator. You belong to your Namima, or your family. You belong to our culture. You have a place within our culture. You're connected to everything around you. And you're loved. You belong. Gaila Kasla.